Buonasera a tutti, good evening and welcome to the Italian Radio Hour. Io sono Viviana and I would like to welcome back our regular listeners and also welcome any new listeners. Also be sure to like us on Instagram and Facebook at Italian Radio Hour and subscribe to our YouTube channel to catch up on any past video interviews. Vorrei dare il benvenuto ai nostri ascoltatori da tutto il mondo, grazie per essere con noi anche oggi mentre continuiamo il nostro viaggio per l'Italia e la cultura italiana. Well, I couldn't be more excited to, uh, for our returning guest, uh, Francis uh, Mays has graciously agreed to come back um, to talk about her latest uh, publication, but uh, a little bit about uh, Francis Mays. Uh, obviously, she's a prolific uh, writer, uh, a poet, and, uh, you know, obviously very well known for her be worldwide uh, best-selling memoir, Under the Tuscan Sun, and uh, that um, makes us participate in her buying and renovation of Villa Bramasole in Cortona with her husband, Ed. Um, the uh, the book also became a hit uh, movie. Uh, some of our most recent uh, books also include See You in the Piazza and Always Italy, uh, both non-fiction travel books, as well as the novel Women in Sunlight, uh, about four retirement age women who moved to Tuscany. And uh, Francis and her husband had split their time between Cortona and North Carolina. And we'll find out where Pasta Veloce actually was written. But uh, before we bring Francis on to the program, a little publicità. Parli italiano? Do you want to improve or master your Italian? Istituto Mondo Italiano can help. Located in the heart of Region Square, Mondo Italiano offers small group classes and one-on-one -on -one private tutoring to help you learn Italian in no time. Visit us online at www.istitutomondoitaliano.org. Un caffè, per favore. My first cup of coffee sets the tone for my entire day, and I get my coffee at La Prima Espresso. La Prima has been brewing Pittsburgh's best coffee for nearly 35 years. Try any of their in-house roasted varieties of beans from all over the world at home, or come and enjoy an espresso or a cappuccino at any of their locations, where their friendly baristas and familiar faces will make you feel at home. Because a trip to La Prima is like a trip to Italy, only closer to home. Well, benvenuta Francis, welcome, welcome to the program. How are you today? I'm Jono, I'm very good. It's lovely to be with you again. Uh, I love your blouse. Uh, um, let me uh, you. a comment on your beautiful. <laughs> it's got every color, it goes with everything. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. So uh, when I see you, when I saw you a um, couple of months ago, you were um, along with uh, um, another Susan, uh, very important in your life, Susan Gravely. Today we'll talk about uh, uh, the other uh, best friend, Susan Weiler. Um, but uh, first of all, uh, I wanted to um, kind of uh, reintroduce yourself because we touch different generations. We touch people from uh, many different countries and we always take for granted that people know everything about everyone. I mean, who doesn't know <laughs> about you? But I am personally very curious to learn a little bit about your journey to Italy how you got um, magnetized by the country, or maybe when was your first trip, or at what point did Italy start to matter in your life? I studied a lot of art history in college, and I couldn't wait to get to Italy to see all the art that I had seen the slides on the wall of. And so I got there, and like everybody else, I just totally uh, felt mesmerized by so many aspects of the country. And one of the most vivid of those was the vivacity of Italian life. The art, yes, the cuisine, yes, the history, the culture, everything, yes. Mm -hmm. But still, I think what I respond to very much all over Italy is that sense that life is to be lived. And there's just a, a, a magnetizing, uh, atmosphere in just about every place I've ever been in Italy, 
we were in Bologna specifically at first, and we were in those beautiful arcades having coffee, and everybody was moving around and talking and smoking and laughing. And I, I said to the person I was with, these people are having more fun than we are. So <laughs> that was kind of, uh, you know, the first hit of Italy. So since mm -hmm. then, I've been going back anytime I could. And of mm -hmm. course, since we bought the house, we've been spending about as much as half a year there. Mm -hmm. Every year, I'm just leaving soon for six months. I can't wait. Yes, I was going to, I was doing the count. I was like, this is about the time that uh, Francis will, tra uh, will transition back. So uh, at what point uh, was um, the desire to actually own a home um, in Italy uh, started to resonate with both uh, you and your husband, Ed? Because one thing is going on vacationing, traveling throughout Italy. But um, not only the financial investment, but the commitment, because you'll probably share with us that renovating a home is something that <laughs> it doesn't happen overnight, especially no, a beautiful home. Like it's yours. kind of an ongoing so, thing. It never ends. You know? It's like growing a child. <laughs> that yes, might be well, in their I rented, and they're still <laughs> For several years, um, I rented in the summer. I was university professor, so I had all the summers off. So for many years, um, I rented a house for a month in different parts of Italy. And the first place I ever rented was near Cortona. Hmm. And all the years after, I kept going back to Cortona. It just had something that pulled me. And hmm. finally, I decided that I needed a permanent hold, a place that I could put down roots there. Mm -hmm. So began to look. I looked a lot of places. Tuscany was where I wanted to be. Mm -hmm. And um, some of those um, adventures I recounted in my books. But when we found Ramasole, we knew exactly that that was the house for mm -hmm. us. And mm -hmm. we've been renovating it, changing it, mainly working in the gardens ever since. The garden mm -hmm. is a great joy because any little plant you put down, any seed you put down, and like the next day it's alive, it's moving. It's the soil around our house is like, I used to say it was like chocolate cake. It was so, you know, <laughs> moist and, and ready. <laughs> yes. Um, I actually going to ask one question related to the previous one and then um, something about the garden. So, uh, you know, a lot of people, I mean, we at Istituto Mondo Italiano, we work with uh, people um, that um, you know are learning the uh, the language or maybe have um, pursued the dual citizenship, and there is this common um, theme of I want to retire in Italy, I want to go to Italy, and I personally am from Rome, and my husband and I have now decided um, you know where eventually that place is going to be, and that's why every summer we tour quite a bit because. Uh -huh. uh, you feel that your selection criteria, if any, so to speak, might change also in where you're at in your life, uh, yes. where maybe before you wanted the metropolitan area, whereas uh, at some point you say, no, enough of that, we want to. Uh, did you and Ed um, had something that you agreed upon that you were looking for in addition to Brahma? So it'd be beautiful, fantastic, uh, but um, some some criteria that uh, they were very important in the selection of the place. We knew we wanted to be in the country, mm -hmm. but we also had the bonus with Bromsole of being within easy walking distance to one of the most beautiful towns in the world. So it just seemed like an ideal spot. We were living in San Francisco, so we had a city life. Mm -hmm. And... Um, so we definitely wanted to have our basil plants and our tomato <laughs> plants and be able to live in that beautiful countryside. Uh -huh. Well, that ties in into the other question that I was going to do once, uh, I'm going to ask you once you had mentioned your basil plant and so forth. Um, how, how, did you, how did you start? Did you start with the small patches and eventually grew up? And now you talk about the gardens, so I'm, you know, aesthetically, extremely um, pleasing. Um, so how did the, uh, the, the garden, everything uh, de developed over time? 
when we bought the place, it was so overgrown. We hardly knew what was there. We hardly <laughs> we had olive trees because there were blackberries and just mm -hmm. wild bushes and sumac everywhere. So we started to clear and we realized we had all these wonderful olive trees. Mm -hmm. And the front garden, front of the house, there was the remains of a formal garden. So that mm -hmm. has kind of set the tone for our our flower gardens was this remnant of a long boxwood hedge with topiaries coming out of it, tall topiaries. And that little bit of the formal garden we kept and built around. We have um, 10 huge pots of lemons that run along this topiary walk. So that gave me the structure. It's a formal Italian structure. But within that, I wanted a kind of sense of wild abandon with the flowers. So it's kind of a mixed garden. It has the structure of the, you know, like the Medici gardens or any formal gardens. It has that structure, although on a smaller scale. Mm -hmm. But um, we have perennials that come back, lavender, catmint, gaura, all these kind of blousy looking flowers that soften it. We have a lot of... Uh, areas of flower gardens. We actually now have just a small vegetable garden because we, we travel a lot, but um, we still have our, you know, our peppers and tomatoes and herbs and um, zucchini and uh, several different kinds of hot peppers. Wonderful. So uh, hard to leave such a scenery, but if we venture out from Bravansole, how far is the city center? And for uh, someone that has not been to Cortona, uh, what is the daily life or daily scene uh, that you would uh, uh, join you into town? We're just a mile, a mile walk, two kilometer walk from town. And the town itself is Etruscan based. It's mostly medieval in appearance. But it has two main wonderful, lively piazzas. And that's life there, the life of the piazza. It's like the living room, as you know, with uh, every town in Italy has a piazza, piazza, I think. So I usually walk in in the mornings and have coffee. I see friends, I do my shopping. During the course of shopping, I run into people and they tell me recipes and recommend things that uh, I should try. And it's just a very intense sense of community there. It's not supermarket shopping. It's you go to the one place for cheese, one place for wine, to the little outdoor market, for vegetables, to the butcher. You no, know, it's still that kind of place where you're going from place to place to gather everything you need. And that is so much fun. It's so much more fun than taking big cart through the supermarket and looking for things all over the place. It's just mm -hmm. more humane. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's exciting. And every time I go in, I, I love the place. And oddly enough, after being there so many years, often I see something that I've never seen before. You know, mm -hmm. a little kind of stone face up in a wall or just some view into a garden where a big datura bush is blooming or there's just surprise in the everyday. And that's, I think, one of the joys of Italian life. And you experience that everywhere. Like for my book, Always Italy, I went to all 20 regions of Italy. Mm -hmm. I went to hundreds of small towns and you know most of the major larger towns. So I've had quite a, uh, that's the book. Yeah, I had quite a chance to get to know um, daily life in Italy from top to toe. And uh, I'm missing one region that I'm going to hit this uh, summer, Val d'Aosta. And uh, uh, you're always, uh, um, Italy's been my companion on my nightstand for, for some time. I, I like to indulge in the reading, the pictures and planning some of the discoveries and, and, and so forth. Uh, so, Francis, so how long have you been going um, or established, so to speak, residence in, in Cortona? How many years are we talking about now? We bought the house in 1990, 
but mm -hmm. we were first there in 1985. So, you know, a lifetime. It's, uh, yeah. I've lived there longer than I have anywhere else, anywhere yeah. in my life. And, and uh, so whenever you stroll through the town, because you're there for some, you know, uh, you have now become part of the social fabric of uh, Cortona. Uh, do they call you Francis or Francesca, or uh, do they have any way that they pronounce your name a little differently? Probably I do too. <laughs> no, it's Francesca, Francis, yes. But, you know, Italy still has quite a formal uh, aspect signora. as well. So mm -hmm. often it's signora, signora. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I really yes. like the Signora. It's got sort of a dignity to it and makes you feel like a <laughs> grown up. <laughs> uh, what what, what uh, were your strategies to actually become a local versus just someone that's um, invested in a beautiful property and goes there and just, you know, uh, because, you know, that's how I, I see you as a local person, you know. Uh, with celebrity local person, but uh, what were your uh, strategies to really become a cor Cortonese? Can we say Cortonese? Cortonese, <laughs> yes. Well, I, I think I'll always uh, be kind of halfway between, you know, the Stranieri are always going to be a little bit different from the Cortonese, but, you know, halfway, I am very much at home there. And I think we got to be feeling at home very early on because we did a lot of the work on our house ourselves, the restoration. We didn't really have the money just to hire people and say, fix it, see you later. Mm -hmm. So we were uh, stripping floors and beams and we hired people to do a lot of the other work, but we were kind of working along with them. So we got to know so many people, so mm -hmm. many local people. We were running into town for whitewash and you know, whatever they needed. So, you probably, you're Italian and that, that terminology is probably stronger than mine. <laughs> I had to do all of that in the US. So um, we just I got to know people and, you know, the men started inviting us to baptisms and weddings and to dinner at their houses. And it was a good way, a quick way to get to know people. I think if we had just hired somebody to fix it, it would have taken us years to mm -hmm. be known. I think everybody thought we were crazy because we had taken on this house that had been sitting there for 30 years with nobody mm -hmm. living in it and totally overgrown. It was kind of like a haunted house. Uh -huh. But a lot of people had a lot of memories of the house because it was kind of mysterious. An mm -hmm. empty house is always kind of mysterious. But mm -hmm. people went there to pick blackberries there are lots of wild daffodils that are mm -hmm. naturalized on the hills. And so they went there to pick wild strawberries and wild asparagus. And for the first few years we were there, we'd still have people, you know, coming up ready to pick things. <laughs> mm -hmm. So that was, um, that was the kind of introduction to the place for us. And uh, you also uh, invested in learning the language. Um, if yes. I and I'm going to excuse myself for a second because we're going to do something a little bit and I need to fetch something, but please share your, <laughs> your, your stories, your journey into the Italian language. Well, it's, I'm not very good at languages myself and I've studied several, but we took, um, initially we took a month long course in Siena at one of the Dante Alighieri schools. So we walked out of there thinking we spoke Italian. We couldn't have been more mistaken. And then we um, we were working with people restoring the house. And, you know, in Italy, dialects are still very strong. So we were learning a lot of dialect words, and we didn't know the difference between the dialect and the real language. So I've always, I've always had kind of a bastardized grasp of the language. My mm -hmm. husband's much better at Italian than I am it's you know some people just have that gift and some people don't I'm unfortunately one of those who don't <laughs> <laughs> I understand um, quite well but I really hate public speaking in Italian I always feel just extremely nervous 
<laughs> okay, so you, you do engage in uh, in public speaking in, uh, in Italian. <laughs> as little as possible. <laughs> Uh, well, do you, do you consider that also having made the difference into, again, um, getting acclimated and being able also to have a certain level of uh, autonomy and independence? Uh, kind of, you could, you could be a whole person in, in Italy on yes. your own. Yes, the, there are now so many uh, people from many countries living all over Italy that if you move there, you can you can find a group of people who speak your language, but I, unless you really make an effort, um, I think you maintain an out, kind of outsider status. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very important. Mm -hmm. But you know, if you get there when you're middle aged, it's not easy. Everybody always says Italian's easy. It's not easy. It has all of those past tenses. <laughs> Italy has a lot of past and. <laughs> they have a lot of history and we need a lot of tenses to transpose it's all those very easy, you know, to learn to order in a restaurant and say come uh -huh. style, et cetera. But um uh -huh. to really um I think the spoken Italian is a lot easier than the written. Do you find that? Uh well uh, uh it was easy for you uh, anyway. Yeah, but. I mean if you had to if you had to write uh you know there is a lot of that uh, formality that is usually injected in uh um, that type of writing that we're not talking about a simple email to a friend. And uh those cliches are highly observed, um uh rigorously observed as well. Uh speaking um is something that an adult learner usually develops uh, the self-consciousness is usually an adult's uh, first enemy. It's not the language itself. Uh as a child, you just like tibuti, you just repeat and uh mm -hmm. you have no idea of self-consciousness. But as an adult, so we're trying to be perfect, not making a mistake. And sometimes I tell my students, uh, you know, the biggest uh uh, your biggest obstacle is just yourself. Just, you know, let your hair down. You know, it's kind of, you can't be the yeah. same caliber of whoever you are in your professional and personal life in your native language immediately. You'll get there. But uh, yes. um, I still like speaking English and uh, here we are on a radio program. <laughs> yeah, English is incredible. Well, um, it's, a, it's always a dream because it's wonderful to start learning a language, I think, at any age, because you will never get to the end of it. it. There will always be something new and fun and exciting for you to learn. So in that way, no matter what a challenge it is, it's, it's a great thing to do. Um, mm -hmm. If I were moving to Greece today, the first thing I would do is take a language course and mm -hmm. you know, try. Greek is really hard. but. Mm -hmm. um, any any uh, place you move, I think it's best to get in there and, yeah. and try. Yeah, even because, uh, as I said, the uh, we might when we move as adults, so we might have established careers, personalities, personal lives, and everything. So when you are in the new country and you just have your baby, whatever language is, then you feel that your whole persona is really limited to oh, how is the food? Oh, good. How is the weather? And then if you're with native speakers, unfortunately, it will be very unnatural for all of them to speak in the foreign language if they're yes. all native yes and uh, i've seen i became such a uh we my husband and i lived in in, in turkey for a good year and uh, i became even a greater people observer to the point that i was observing um uh, actions and tell my husband who is a native speaker said i think the lady is going to do this and, and he said how, how how do you know and that's exactly what happened is because I was watching even more, even without having the need to hear, or you know, I could anticipate what was coming. Yes, these guys. Uh, yeah, clues. Yeah, exactly. You trying to mix that. <laughs> <laughs> um, one other question, then we'll we'll definitely move to pasta veloce because we need to make something here. And, uh, and maybe um, if uh, your husband Ed uh, would like to join you, I would love to meet him. But talking about uh, integrating into the um, uh, Cortona, uh, what is, in your opinion, the best way or where you would be more likely to make uh, Italian friends? <laughs> I, in the bars, in the piazza, that's 
that's where that's where we still meet a lot of people. And I think that morning cappuccino out in the piazza with everybody out doing their shopping, you just, in a very natural way, you run into a lot of people and, and have conversations and, you know, going out to restaurants at night, you end up talking to people at the next table. Mm -hmm. Italians, uh, I mean, it's impossible to generalize about any culture, but if I could, um, venture one generalization I think that it's pretty safe to say that the Italians are extremely friendly and willing I mean I see Italian friends talking to tourists all the time it's not mm -hmm. like in some other countries where you only meet the waiter and the taxi driver it's not like that the, oh, I just had another oh, I had a question for you oh yes uh, you know, obviously you cannot turn on and off your uh, desire to write, um, especially because you might have your cappuccino and before you know, a scene presents itself that you hadn't expected, right? Um, so is the stereotype of expecting a writer always to have something to write on uh, correct or do you use technology uh, on and off to help you <laughs> uh, in your oh. writing process? <laughs> I started using a computer in what early 80s so mm -hmm. yes I use the computer a lot mm -hmm. but I must say most of my ideas my creative ideas for writing come to me because I am an insomniac and I'm awake at three and four in the morning and I'm thinking oh now what would what would that character do and where shall I go next and just, I get a lot of ideas in the middle of the night. Also, just like waking up early in the morning before I get up, that's where I get ideas too. So it's quite, it's quite mysterious to me that the creative part of writing comes to me in kind of a semi-conscious state. <laughs> but that said, I mean, here you are in front of the screen or in front of the legal pad and you're writing and revising and revising again and looking up things. And there's a lot of very particular work to do. So mm -hmm. I really enjoy writing. I don't have a particular schedule. Mm -hmm. I write when I feel so inclined, but um, I'm very distractible. I can be talked into going out for a walk <laughs> or to go shopping or whatever. <laughs> I don't, I, I've never been one of those, you know, smart writers who write from eight until one and then two until four. Just doesn't work that way for me. But I've learned, I think many writers learn to trust whatever their process is. And mm -hmm. that's fine. And I somehow end up getting a lot of work done. I've published a lot of books, so I don't worry about it anymore. They'll, mm -hmm lash myself for thinking <laughs> oh you should be doing this <laughs> you, know? you still find the time to smell the roses and everything so uh francis uh the curiosity now continues to develop on your latest and the greatest <laughs> your pasta veloce irresistibly fast recipes from under the Tuscan sun with Francis Mays and Susan Weiler and the beautiful pictures of uh, Stephen uh, Rothfeld uh, that accompanies uh, your um, uh, the, the recipes and and so forth so the uh, the tell us a little bit first about who Susan is for those that might not be familiar with um, another very recognizable uh, um, uh, name and a little bit about your friendship, how you got to know one another. Susan and I just go back like a hundred years. It's so odd that we both ended up living in a small North Carolina town. Mm -hmm. because we both lived all over the place, but um, she ended up here and I did too, and we reconnected. We met in our 20s. We were uh, both living in New York area, not in the city, but um, she was working in the city. And we met and we started having a lot of dinner parties. We were cooking our way through Julia Child at the moment, <laughs> at that moment. 
And we had, you know, we were in our 20s and we were having these extremely fancy veal prince Olaf and things, you know, complicated things from Julia Child. And Susan was working for um, the Betty Crocker. Do you mm -hmm. remember Betty Crocker? Oh, yes. She was mm -hmm. working for Betty Crocker Publishing. And I was a poet. I was trying to get my poems published and I had a baby. And so I was at home and very admiring of her off in New York City with the publishing job. And she actually hired me to write the copy in a Betty Crocker cookbook. And that was my first food uh, food writing ever that I did that. So we, we just stayed friends. We kind of stayed in touch. She's been to visit me many times in Italy. And when I had a house in Mexico, she came there and we've cooked together in all these places. So during COVID, we were living three houses down from each other. Mm -hmm. We were between houses. So we were renting a small house at that time. And um, I had had the idea a long time ago of doing a pasta cookbook. So here it was COVID time. We couldn't have people over for dinner. We couldn't go out to dinner, but she and Ed and I formed this little bubble. And one night, she made this incredible pasta with uh, lemon and pistachio. Mm -hmm. It's one of my favorite recipes in here. Mm -hmm. It's just divine. And I was saying how great it was. And she said, well, it takes like 10 minutes. It's nothing. It's just so easy. And I went home and I remembered my old idea that I wanted to do a pasta book. So the next day I called her and I said, Susan, we, have, we can't go anywhere. We can't do anything. Why don't we write a pasta cookbook? So we just had the best time during COVID because we were uh, ordering our groceries that were coming delivered to the door. <laughs> we were making all these wonderful pastas. And we, um, we wanted to do fast pasta. Pasta mm -hmm. you can make in the time it takes the water to boil and the pasta to cook, which mm -hmm. is roughly like, 20 to 30 minutes at the most. Mm -hmm. So these recipes, there are a hundred of them and almost all of them, there are two or three that are a little bit longer, but most of them are, are ready to be made in that amount of time. Yes, for the big appetite with little time. And, uh, uh, and then you also had a challenge with your own husband, more than a challenge, like some sort of a, a attempt to make a, a, a different pasta dish for 300 for the whole year. That, that was, must be a lot of improvisation, a lot of fun. And uh, tell us a little bit about uh, about that. That was challenge. actually the instigation <laughs> for the cookbook, the idea I originally had, because we cook, you know, every night in Italy and Ed said one day, I want to have a different pasta every single day of the year. And I thought, oh, that would be great because um, we're really into innovation and had been steeped in the Italian way of just opening the fridge and seeing what's there and what you can make from it, what you can create from what you have. Mm -hmm. So we started doing that. Of course, we couldn't keep it up. We just, you know, life interferes. But um, it, that gave me such a, a grasp of how important innovation is to, to Italian cuisine and, and to the, you know, the backstory of Italian cuisine. And, and it's the most, I think, loved cuisine in the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't see restaurants from Belgium and Iceland and <laughs> You know, then there's not out there, but everywhere you go, there is um, an Italian restaurant. Mm -hmm. And we, having cooked there so much and have watched our neighbors put together dinner for eight in short amounts of time, I really began to appreciate the roots of Italian cuisine, which is the cucina povera, how that make-do uh, philosophy really 
caused the innovation in Italian in, in Italian cuisine because there have been many times in Italian history when the, the cupboard was bare and people were out foraging for figs and mushrooms and fennel and nettles and uh, borage and even the wild hyacinth bulbs became <laughs> useful in making a very good pasta. I've actually tried it, but you know, chestnuts and fish, things that you could get from the earth itself. That tradition has actually persisted. Now, most Italians have beautiful dispenser full of food. It's not an issue anymore that they have to do this, mm -hmm. but they still do. Mm -hmm. They're out in early spring picking those green new almonds, those crunchy almonds. Mm -hmm. um, they would kill for wild asparagus, <laughs> breaking their ankles, reaching over ditches to get the wild fennel. And it's still a part of life. I mean, foraging has become kind of trendy here. You know, mm -hmm. people go out looking for ramps and fiddleheads, but it's nothing to do with their sustenance, which mm -hmm. it was for Italians for many, many years, and it, it still persists. Yes, so the uh, cucina povera, or just uh, l'arte dell'arrangiarsi, del make do with wherever you have, has created uh, not only some of the iconic dishes, but also, uh, you know, some variations. Um, if you were to narrow down maybe the top, I don't want to say the top three ingredients, but something that's really important for you um, in Italian food or just in food in general, what would you um, identify those ingredients to, to be? Well, pasta, pasta, pasta. Uh, <laughs> pasta is, it's kind of like the universal donor in Italy. And I don't know of any other cuisine that has, I mean, a lot of uh, Asian cuisines have a, a noodle-based mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. culture. And of course, in Mexico, the, um, the corn, the tortillas is mm -hmm. kind of that same idea. But I don't think anywhere it goes as extensively as it does in Italy. Pasta. I mean, what do we have in America? We have uh, we have the hamburger as our icon dish, but nobody wants a hamburger every day. But my Italian friends have pasta every day of their lives, and sometimes twice. Mm -hmm. So it's it's um, it's ubiquitous, and mm -hmm. it's it's just kind of the perfect vehicle for any mm -hmm. kind of experimentation you want to do with food. Mm -hmm. um, we were focused on doing things quickly, but we also wanted to put taste forward mm -hmm. and we wanted to update so maybe mm, emphasize some of the um, talents of the most loved dishes, say cacio e pepe. Mm -hmm. Cacio e pepe, it is the simplest pasta in the world. It's mm -hmm. not that easy to make, however. It is not because they can't get, get, the, the, how to get <laughs> more of the pasta water just right. But we did little small things to uh, emphasize the, you know, the qualities of some of the uh, traditional dishes. Like for cacio e pepe, we put the pepper and a lot of it in the mm -hmm. skillet and toast mm -hmm. it. In the regular recipe, you just put the pepper in, but mm -hmm. we found that toasting it really intensified the flavor. So mm -hmm. all through the books, book, we're doing things like that. Um, Susan's had, she was editor of uh, food, food editor of Food and Wine magazine. She's cooked mainly in France, but she's, she's just a fantastic cook. So she mm -hmm. was extremely uh, good at bringing out these, um, qualities of the traditional pastas. And also she and I had such a great time experimenting around pesto. We know pesto, Genovese pesto, but we have a lot of other pestos that are really good that we developed. And that's the one that I would like to try. So I have some pasta boiling because otherwise it would have oh. taken too long but then uh i will reveal once my pasta is ready i will reveal the recipe you're gonna guide me through because i was actually very uh, intrigued i like to make my pesto with uh 
uh, pistachio, uh, now more often than uh, pine nuts. But this one um, is with a different uh, type of nut and different juices. And I'm sure you know. <laughs> but uh, yes, so the, the, the different paces that you uh, propose is also something. As soon as I opened the book, the eye just went there. And I had to hold my... <laughs> wanted to try until today I saved it for our special conversation oh good uh, well, well, pesto, what know, else they're so mm -hmm. useful not only for pasta but to a pesto if you add mascarpone or cream cheese mm -hmm. you've got a spread or a dip uh there are other ways to use the pesto other than just I mean there's I love uh pesto genovese over grilled chicken it helps bring out the flavors of the meat too. Mm -hmm. And that's something that you uh, you talk about, some of the, uh, um, and indeed it was uh, on top of this pesto recipe that um, we'll be sharing in a second, that you talk about how the pesto can enhance um, maybe the flavor of shrimp or chicken and so forth. Um, is there any other ingredients that uh, you want to spend? Um, first of all, I see salt and water secrets to cooking uh, with its uh, elemental mix. <laughs> Some people well, might the, under. Mm -hmm. I think one of the kind of surprises that might be for some people is how much um, red pepper, hot pepper, is used in Italian cooking. I don't think you see that much in Italian restaurants in America, but in mm -hmm. Italy, there's a uh, shaker on the table of hot pepper, mm -hmm. and the, the Tuscans particularly. And the Calabrese, they're very- uh -huh. the, they call it the, the Calabrian Viagra, if you get one of those, uh, <laughs> that's, uh, those peppers. <laughs> yes, you know, on the table, you don't see salt. There's not a salt shaker on the table, usually in any restaurant, except maybe those that cater to, to uh, foreign visitors. But the Italians know that you use salt in the cooking, not on the cooking. Mm -hmm. It has to work with the other ingredients as you're making it. So you don't see, and I often see, um, you know, tourists saying, where's the salt? Where's the salt? But you shouldn't have to add sure. salt. It should yes, be. Yes, trust already. it's in there and it's in the right proportion. <laughs> already seasoned. <laughs> uh, there's so many ingredients. I think one of my favorites is artichokes. There's a time twice a year when everyone's rushing to the market to get artichokes. There's hardly anything better as an antipasto than fried artichokes. And we, <laughs> we have, um, we use in our book, because it's fast cooking, we use um, jarred artichokes and frozen mm -hmm. artichokes, but they're mm -hmm. very dressed up and tasty. Oh, yes. You have cavatappi with pancetta, artichokes, tomatoes, and olives. That sounds delicious. Piperigate with artichokes, ricotta, salata, olives, and tomatoes. I could have made that one. I have actually ricotta salata in the fridge. And strozza preti with mozzarella, tomatoes, artichokes, and Mediterranean herbs. Um, I think I'm going to cancel all the interviews for the rest of the day and just keep on cooking. Um, but uh, uh, so we are actually moving into... Um, um, do you think Edda will be able to join us uh, in a little bit? Yes, Is he yeah. around? <laughs> I wanted so, to uh, join us because yes. uh, you know, we're talking about ingredients. I think in pasta making, here he is right here. Can you squeeze yes. up? <laughs> Welcome. Very nice Hello. to meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you. Buongiorno. Feel, buongiorno. You're located in the East Coast. Right. On these goes. So uh, right now, for only a few weeks still, we are in the same time zone. And then I know that you and uh, Francis will be yes. uh, taking our uh, way to Italia. Mm -hmm. Yes. So. so the recipe that I have chosen is the Sicilian citrus pesto, uh, specifically oh. in your book on page uh, 206. When I looked at this recipe, uh, I said, I've never used the citrus, uh, uh, the this juice of the citrus fruits to um, to blend my pesto. Before we go into the recipe, um, while I'm still scooping up some of the pasta from my pasta water here, um, one ingredient um, um, that is very important was going to be probably the next one you're going to mention is olive oil. The and, most uh, the most. Uh, 
And I, yes, and I wanted, so among the many things that we can be jealous of about Brahma Sole is also your beautiful uh, olive growth and your own uh, production of uh, your own uh, Brahma Sole um, oil. Nice. Um, can you tell, uh, tell, you know, tell us a little bit about um, maybe less known facts or even the generic process, anything that you would like to share about um, um, olive, olive trees and olive oil? I want we're, to we're hungry for knowledge. <laughs> I want to add something to what Francis, I heard Francis talking about how to integrate yourself into the community in mm -hmm. Italy. And the one of the best things that happened to us was to have an olive grove, to have to hire friends, to have friends over, Italian friends, to hire people, the gardener, to pick help pick our olives, which is mm -hmm. a two-week process, and taking it down to the mill, getting to know the mill owners, getting to know other Italians who are also pressing their olives. And then mm -hmm. once our olives are pressed and the oil is ready, we have uh parties with other celebrations we all have our own <laughs> olive oil and we're doing a blind tasting and we're having bruschetta <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it's, Com i'm sorry comparing right <laughs> yes right. comparing competing it's all good everybody it thinks is, theirs is right, the best right. ours is the best everybody's is the best it's fine so, it's basically so they, they, no one talks about anything else but their olive oil until kind of <laughs> nobody <laughs> talks much from from September to Christmas about olive oil is that I mean that that is that, that when you're picking olives you see people in the piazza and they say so how much did you pick today how many what was your what was your yield what was your yeah, is your it 15 percent your raise out of the, the 15 percent did you get eight uh was it you know all this olive oil talk is just fabulous there I mean, because <laughs> Italy as you know is an olive oil culture Spain, <laughs> olive oil culture, so is Greece, but we in America, unfortunately, are not. Yes, yeah, only we, we don't. We have a little bit, a little yeah. short, a small amount of growers in California who do Spanish Maybe oil. Texas as well. You might yeah, but tiny, Texas tiny, tiny. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's insignificant, really. And mm -hmm. I mean, it's starting out, but whether they have the climate, whether they have the whole infrastructure of uh, the right kind of mills, the right kind of, are they getting their olives to the mill within three hours, four hours, or are they sitting around for two days getting rancid, you know? So the, I think olive oil is, you know, having been picking our own olives for over three decades, and our oil is the only oil we've ever really used, and we use a lot of it, a lot of it. I mean, I, I was... I love getting in con conversations to practice my Italian with lots of different Italians when we're over there. And I, olive oil is always a subject. How much do you use a year? That kind of thing. We, I, I ask people that all the time, and it's it's amazing how you know. I think it's average of something like ten liters mm -hmm. a person. Yeah. And in America, it's a quarter cup a person. Oh well. A quarter cup. And even the FDA recommends two tablespoons of olive oil yes. mm -hmm. a day. But the I think the you know the real problem, I mean, it is the, the most essential ingredient in Italian cooking, without a mm -hmm. doubt. Mm -hmm. And when we used to come uh before we had olives in in at Bramasole, we, we were going over there for three or four years, we would sometimes bring oil back if we could. Mm -hmm. But in San Francisco, even in San Francisco in the late 80s, it was hard to find good oil. Mm -hmm. Very, impossible. very, very, almost impossible. It was those little green bottles, you know. And we would come back, pay. we would come back uh, hoping to emulate the fabulous food we had in Italy. Mm -hmm. But you, we could never do that because you can't find the right oil. Mm -hmm. our, it, it's extra virgin, extra virgin from that year, the harvesting. Yeah. All of our oil is stamped with the harvest date, which is mm -hmm. the most important thing on any label of extra virgin mm -hmm. olive oil. Because yes. I, mean, I was at, at Whole Foods uh, a couple of days ago looking at their thousands, hundreds of oils, and some of them had a harvest date on the back, 
but it was from 2021. Okay. It's mm -hmm. already too old. So I was going to ask you, uh, what happens, uh, what would you say the lifespan of the uh, olive oil should be consumed within a year? A uh, year. A year is the best. The way, the, the way we do it in Italy is we get our olive oil in October, and mm -hmm. that's the freshest and most incredible oil. But we still have oil from the, from the harvest before. We don't use mm -hmm. it all up necessarily, especially mm -hmm. for various reasons. So we still continue to use that oil from the previous harvest for mm -hmm. all of our cooking, but we use the fresh oil for splattering over vegetables, over I mean, pasta. It's closer to the palate, right? Um, Anything. And then when we finish up our previous year's harvest, then we start using more and more and more of the current use harvest. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's an, a year, maybe a year and a half, but most oil in the United States uh, if you look in grocery stores, is, mm -hmm. is way out of date. So it's no, no, for health reasons or taste reasons. Because it loses, it its, loses taste. its properties. The taste might still yeah. be okay for a while, but right. it loses uh, that. Polyphenols, polyphenols, all those incredible antioxidants. antioxidants. Mm -hmm. That's what is, I mean, that's one of the secret ingredients of Italian life. It's why they live yes. 10 years longer than America. Mm -hmm. um, um, now, for people, when you taste the oil, uh -huh. uh, especially when it's firstly um, coming out, you have a little bit of a. I mean, it, it it does have to it does have to leave some sort of taste. I don't want to say aftertaste, but it's not something but you it's know. Bitter. It, it's bitter. It's really, yes, yeah. it is. It is a um, a bitter taste, and that's the polyphenol count. Mm -hmm. The bitter yeah. the oil. <laughs> I think it might, a better word might be picante. Picante. It's uh, not a bitter to me. It's like this little tickle in your throat. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, I was going to say prickly, but it's a right, tingle, it, yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. Italians would, would say maybe a little bit bitter because they, they like bitter. I mean, a lot mm -hmm. of Italians. Amaro. 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 Um, but, uh, but for pastas, I think olive oil is particularly important. Yes. Because for making pastas, the three kind of essential ingredients other than the pasta itself are the salt, the water, and the olive oil. Right. And the olive oil is probably the greatest of those. But I mean, most Americans don't really understand how much to salt pasta water. Right. They put in mm -hmm. a teaspoon and that's not enough. Right. Uh, I put in two heaping tablespoons into a big pot. What about you, Viviana? How much salt do you put in pasta? Um, it varies. Uh, I usually put it like today, I because I'm sitting, so I couldn't really see how much I had it. I went for a little handful and then Absolutely. I taste a little bit. And then I, uh, you know, so it really, um, it's I never measured it wherever my little palm holds right. oh, yes. <laughs> it depends on it depends on the size of the pot and how much uh, pasta is gonna go there as well so but uh, mm -hmm. very yeah. mysterious thing that the basis for so much pasta is the pasta water right. mm -hmm. and I think a lot of people feel that when they put in a little pasta water they're just adding some liquid they're just moisturizing it but that water has absorbed the starch, starch. Has everything. Exactly. So for the temperature, it's perfect. Yes. So when you put in the water, you're adding an ingredient. It's not just water. It's mm -hmm. that binding that's going to occur with your sauce comes from that mm -hmm. starch. And, okay. and you know, we start with olive oil. With all, every recipe in this book, I right. imagine. Absolutely. Okay. And I think that the quality of that is so important. And I don't know um, if you want to talk about Sansa and what pure oil and you know, those yeah. just yeah. things labeled olive oil. Right. Are. You, you, mm -hmm. you know all about this too, but it's it's the the uh, the complications of how to buy. A bottle of olive oil that is really truly extra virgin recent mm -hmm. harvest oil versus all the oil on the shelves i mean a lot of people think olive oil is all the same isn't it mm -hmm. uh, isn't, you know, 
dollar oil, forty dollar oil. <laughs> Even price doesn't matter all the time. But but um, you know, after our oil is usually about twelve percent, or our our olives yield about twelve percent oil. Mm -hmm. Maybe sometimes fifteen percent depends on a variety of things. Sometimes only ten. So that ninety percent of the olive, or ninety eighty five percent of the olive, is mm -hmm. uh, called Sansa, and it's it's mm -hmm. take it's uh, there's a conveyor belt that uh, takes it out to the yard behind the, the olive mill, and it's uh, it's a big mound, and then a, trucks come and haul it away to the north of Italy so that uh, they're taken to olive uh, production companies that use mm -hmm. hexane, mm -hmm. which is a form of uh, diesel fuel, to extract more oil from mm -hmm. this mealy, kind of dryish uh, residue of 85% of the olive. And then um, that's sometimes you can put some extra virgin olive oil into that mix. Mm -hmm. You can add, you can put some uh, uh, coloring even, mm -hmm. and you can label it extra virgin. Mm -hmm. Nasty. Nasty stuff. <laughs> and it's sitting on the shelves in grocery stores, extra virgin olive oil with no date. So it could be five years old. No origin place. No origin place. You don't know who who pick these olives? We hand pick our olives. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not. There's no machine running around picking the olives. So, I, I think there, th that's the worst oil in a way. The pure olive oil or the extra virgin olive oil with no date. Mm -hmm. Mediterranean. So consumers oil. be aware. Yes. Yeah, you yeah, really Mediterranean do. Blend yeah. Mediterranean that's, blend that's, or something. That's too bad. But the, no. the difference between taking. Uh, a fabulous olive oil, fresh olive oil, and putting it over really good pasta made the way you're wow. supposed to make it with the right amount of salt. With the, and and that that incredible dish of uh, pasta with aglio olio, mm -hmm. you know, just that is. Incredible. But if you try to do that with you mean garlic and oil, just yeah, that. garlic and oil, peperoncino. <laughs> peperoncino. <laughs> exactly. You do that in Italy, in Italy where they have, or here, if you can find the right oil, you, mm -hmm. you make that with the right ingredients and it's an incredible yeah. thing. You make it with the wrong ingredients. You find bad oil, mm -hmm. pasta that's mm -hmm. not cooked properly. <laughs> and it's going to be it's terrible. Sense. It's, it's yeah. The, the difference is incredible. Okay, well, Francis, uh, set me up for some success here now with the Sicilian uh, citrus uh, pesto that um, uh, you feature in uh, in uh, in the book. So uh, can we go? So I have some of the ingredients. I see if you can mention the ingredients, uh, then I uh, can show them. Okay, and uh, we're in for I'm in for a treat. Uh, page two hundred and six has this beautiful picture of these. Uh, uh lemons are to die for this is and uh okay so to the sicilian citrus uh, uh pesto what do i need you need basil mm -hmm. leaves okay i uh, have lots of here. garlic okay. garlic mm -hmm. two cloves of garlic uh, eccolo qua mm -hmm. eccolo qua. um three tablespoons of orange juice uh-huh which First, i have two of salt Mm -hmm. Salt, um, two tablespoons of lemon juice. I got it. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have also the lime. So you had the trifecta of the citruses. You have the uh, lime, lemon, and orange. Okay. And, uh, two tablespoons of sliced almonds. Mm -hmm. okay. And three tablespoons of extra, extra virgin, virgin olive oil. Right. <laughs> okay. And uh, okay, so I'm going. To, yes, so I'm going to pour my ingredients. I have a little uh, blend in here. Okay, and I'm really, really excited uh, to try this recipe. Here is my basil. Let me see. I might actually add a little more. Cannot go wrong with more basilico. Putting it in a blender. 
Good. Yes, I will uh, bring we'll, it's we'll going to get noisy uh, very shortly. Okay, uh, since my husband wants to try as well and he's waiting at home, so I'll make extra. Okay, uh, juice, uh, uh, here we go, just for people. Um, so, suco d'arancia, this one I have a fruit, uh, I, I do have a fresh juice, I do have to resort to the little green uh, yellow bottle. <laughs> you know, I have time uh, to stop. Vediamo quanto me ne serve, tre tablespoons, okay. Um, any any recollection about how this recipe came about whether it's something uh, that you tried uh, I, I had just a, I had a flash of genius <laughs> <laughs> well I thank you very much for that I <laughs> just put it together I had a lot of citrus one day and I love citrus I think if I had to have named one most important thing in my kitchen, it would be lemons. I use lemons all the time. And this is one of those pestos that is excellent if mixed with some cream cheese or mascarpone to spread mm -hmm. on crackers or to dip vegetables into. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, should I blend in the cheese with the mix or should I just put it on top so of when I'm done? done? With the machine on, add the olive oil, then the cheese. Okay. Let me see. I'm gonna. Uh, I need my little lemon. I mean, for the pasta for this one, I would recommend something like a farfalle, oh. something rather delicate. <laughs> Great, oh. eat alike. <laughs> uh, okay. So sorry for the noise. Let's give it a quick. Okay. I'm going to give it obviously a quick taste before you see if uh, I need to add anything because I was kind of eyeing the ingredients a little bit, I have to admit. Typical Italian. Um, you know, one thing that um, amazed me when I first got to Italy was you I, you know, realizing that most Italian cooks don't use cookbooks. They just <laughs> know what to do. <laughs> Let me just uh, put myself on mute to tell us some other stories for a minute. I'll just uh, the the uh, kitchen is gonna make a little bit of noise, but um, um, yes, about the uh, yeah, you can find also the souvenir aprons here in the U.S. You know, I'm Italian; I don't need a rice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we had for our students uh, just a uh, Saturday night. Uh, competition. So back in the day, um, when I was growing up, there was a, a, a challenge, it was called Jockey Senza Frontiere, Games Without Borders. And they were usually like athlete-like, but not Olympic Games, from different countries uh, competing um, in an athletic way, but doing, I don't want to say silly competitions. So we decided to create the first one here in Monte Italiano, where it has some knowledge questions based on uh, others' little challenges. And the first, the last one was a cooking challenge. Mm. And um, uh, they all uh, created beautiful uh, uh, farfalle la caprese. And the, uh, the final, the, the winner was the one that had actually um, the right amount of salt because wow. um, they went and tasted it instead wow. of just going by the length of the box and where it is. So that was the, the, the key, the deciding uh, <laughs> factor. So, okay. Allora, let's make my lunch. I will lower my um, dish in just one second. But uh, again, I went there and uh, um, tried, and I have to say the citrus combination, it just elevates this dish to the end. I won't be able to, um, let me see, I want to get too much in the yeah, and the pesto, the other thing about uh, pesos also that um, is one of those um, um, recipes that goes a long way. Um, you just have to take some extra minutes. You might see all my ingredients now, <laughs> but I'm here mixing my dish. Okay, so um, a little pesto goes along along the way. The aroma is fantastic. I feel transported into Sicily as the recipe 
kind of um, that Sicilian citrus. Uh, okay. And uh, I would say buon appetito a me. Sorry, guys, I cannot share, but you came up with the recipe. You know, you know what you're missing. So, mm. thank you for having that uh, genius moment as you described it before. Um, we do have uh, pasta making classes on a regular basis. And if you don't mind, I would like to feature this in our next class. Right. And, uh, and, uh, and then, um, you know, obviously we'll uh, have the book here because um, the main thing is that, um, as you said before, this recipe took, what, two minutes and pasta is doing its thing. So you can maybe answer to a couple of emails. Don't go too far away when yes. you're cooking pasta. <laughs> And um, yeah, the, my citrus. Little, the citrus is it just, as I said, it really elevates yeah. um, the flavor of the basil. And um, um, it's, it's a combination I have never tried before. So I'm, I'm totally. <laughs> you, could add some so, zest you could add some zest. Yes. Even, so. yes, yes. I can actually use a little bit of uh, the orange peel yes. to yes. Um, create. So when I have a citrus pasta, I. I feel immediately transported to the Amalfi Coast, mm -hmm. where I first tasted um, a pasta made with arugula and lemon. Mm -hmm. And it was in one of those terraced lemon groves, the restaurant. So yes. there was always oh, the yeah. aroma, too, yes. of the lemon blossoms. It's, mm -hmm. So many pasta memories are connected with place. And mm -hmm. I think that's one of the really fun things about cooking in Italy, cooking from Italy. If you travel there at all, you just kind of wedded to, you can't go to Rome without cacio e pepe. You can't go yeah. to Venice without the black spaghetti. Right. Mm -hmm. You can't go to Sicily without a rich, rich tomato sauce. Right. And mm -hmm. So many parts of Italy have different pastas, Excellent. different mm -hmm. sauces. I love the orecchetti and Puglia. In mm -hmm. front of all the restaurants, uh, there's somebody making that. You know, they roll out the little balls that's, and then press yeah. the thumb to make it the yeah. ear shape. That's what we have on schedule this Sunday. That's uh, we will be making uh, orecchiette pugliesi and gnocchetti sardi because it is a similar based. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, now, what about pe peachy, peachy? Peachy is a, the, di the dialect is, in, in yes. Cortana is peachy. Yeah. Pichi al <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Uh, that's our first introduction to pasta making for children uh, uh -huh. or anywhere where um, no tool is needed. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. So, so. Only <laughs> it gets longer and longer yes. and longer. Exactly. Speaking of types of pasta, one thing I definitely wanted to mention is that we had so much fun with is the shapes of pasta. Mm -hmm. You know, most people in their cupboards, they have penne and talia, tally or, of course, the spaghetti, spaghetti lasagna. But we love the different shapes of pasta. And in Italian grocery stores, you just find hundreds mm -hmm. of pastas just in a medium-sized grocery store. Mm -hmm. so for each pasta in here, we recommend a different kind of pasta of course you can use whatever you want but yeah um, but it, it, that's, it's that's just so cool. much fun to try the mm -hmm. uh de gallo the like mm -hmm. the crest of the rooster there's yes. another one that's actually based on the esophagus of a chicken but it's just shows oh. the, the fun and variety mm -hmm. of italian invention like who would think of making a pasta in the shape of a radiator <laughs> they're so they're just so much fun and now you can in grocery stores in america get many more shapes than you used to be able to i've even seen the reginetti which is one of my favorite pasta shapes it's kind of <clears throat> a flat pasta with yeah. a ribboned edge it's so great for so many things um so you can get many more than you used to. everything online but we order online and we are encouraging people who try this book to just 
order like 10 different shapes that you've never tried before. I really love the Gili, which mm. is in the shape of a lily. It just connects you to the Italian imagination, I think. Mm -hmm. To yeah. see all the names of, you know, whistles and pencils and wheels and cigarettes butterflies. and butterflies. Everything has inspired a shape of pasta. And we've got um, many, many listed in here, but this probably doesn't scratch the surface no. of how many. Really and, uh, they are more being invented. Um, um, yeah. So yes, we'll. Uh, um, I, I just, as I said, I, um, I had one question for you, and then we'll go into the closing. Uh, you just said the recipient of these recipes, or um, did you have an input? Uh, are you? Uh, do you like to cook um, as well uh, oh, in your oh, 365 oh. challenge, uh, different pasta day? <laughs> <laughs> Were you taking part? You were just being the quality insurance manager. <laughs> well, uh, Francis and I did the Tuscan Sun cookbook together uh -huh. uh, years ago, maybe 10 years ago. And uh -huh. I cooked every recipe in that book three times, probably mm -hmm. tested. I love to cook. I cook every day. I cook all of our lunches and you many know, of our soups, dinners, soups, soups pastas. pastas, everything. Just, I, I. <laughs> It's a passion. It's a great passion. Yeah, we. I think we had our heads turned around in Italy by the quality of the ingredients. I think that's what made us really get into cooking more. Was you can do something really simple, but if the ingredients are just perfect, like for a simple caprese, it can be a divine, divine salad. It can also be terrible. You've got to have the great right. mozzarella. Got to have that. Fantastic tomatoes. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, that really makes all the difference in the world. Mm -hmm. Great olive oil. Yeah. Great olive oil. Yes, absolutely. And, uh, you know, just to, uh, for people that would like to uh, try your um, olive oil, because it is indeed for sale. So if someone wants to be part of your Brahma Sole, um, you ship from uh, from Italy and you have um, you have the website as well. Let me let me see if I can quickly um, pull it up, and uh, so people can. Uh, uh, the shipping um, is very fast. It gets to your door usually in two or three days. Oh, so mamma mia, little cheese, Simon. But mm -hmm. you know, a week at the most. And the best thing I think about our company of all is that right after we harvest. We rush it, rush it, rush it to mm -hmm. be bottled so that it can be um, available in time for uh, Christmas and holidays. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, yes, and uh, wonderful. Yes, and you got also the uh, an award for the 2022. Is that correct? yes? Uh, the from the Nash from the New York International Olive Oil Competition, which. We've had it. We've gotten uh, the the gold award every year for eight years, I believe. Oh, every year we've gotten some kind of award, best in class. <laughs> and I would recommend that anybody who wants to find out more about olive oil should go to that to our site. There's a lot of information, but also the New York International Olive Oil Competition because mm -hmm. you can find hundreds and hundreds of olive oils from all over the world that have won prizes that have entered this contest. And it's it's really the cream of the crop. And uh, what we do is ship it only by the case. We don't have, we don't sell yeah, it in yeah, yeah. You can't mm -hmm. find it in the United States mm -hmm. uh, yeah. at all, except when you order it online and order six bottles or yes. Well, and mix it, obviously, well, yeah, yeah. Yeah. because you don't want to run out of it. <laughs> I mean, we just saw, since I was saying the other uh, a little while ago that the average Italian does ten liters a, a year. That's, uh, that's <laughs> a half liter bottle, so it's twenty of these bottles. Of those, yes, <laughs> a week. Yeah, that's why we decided to uh, go for the serious olive oil lover, the person who needs to have a lot of oil. And uh, so a case of this is not that much, you know, you yes, really, people mm -hmm. are in multiple cases, but it, we use uh, that much. We use, yeah, we <laughs> definitely. 
<laughs> secret ingredient. Okay. okay. And well, also, we're doing a little promotion for mm-hmm. pasta veloce. Yeah. Yes. And, Tell us about the promotion. Okay. Mm-hmm. That uh, on Francis's events, um, we're doing a 10% discount actually on our oil mm-hmm. uh, until the middle of May, I think. So Viviana's listeners could go to the website and get the promotion by typing I, Pasta Veloce. By typing in you know, the promo codes, the coupon uh-huh. codes, you type in the title of the book, Pasta, Pasta Veloce. Veloce. Okay. And, mm-hmm. and, uh, and your olive oil will be on its way. So... Well, uh, unfortunately, our time together is up today. Big Ben, uh, Dito Stop, it's time for us to say arrivederci e alla prossima. We want to thank you for tuning into the program. If you have any questions or comments, uh, or if you have any topics you would like us to address, please contact us at the Italian Radio Hour at gmail.com. We would love to hear from you. Remember, if you or any of your family and friends have missed a prior episode or would like to listen to this episode again, please visit our website at www.istitutomondoitaliano.org and click on the Italian Radio Hour tab. You can also subscribe to uh, to the Italian Radio Hour on YouTube or where you catch your favorite podcasts. I would like to uh, profusely thank our dynamic duo, Francis Mays and her husband, Ed. (laughs) <laughs> and uh, our sponsor Istituto Mondo Italiano La Prima Espresso and La Buara for the music until next time alla prossima ciao ciao, 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 ciao. ciao, ciao.